A couple of weeks ago, my husband lent me a pair of these dev boards. It is a LilyGo T-Beam based on ESP32 microcontroller with an onboard Ublox GPS module and Semtex LoRa wireless component powered by 18650 rechargeable battery. And he told me that, hey, you know, since uh, you are making a LoRa GPS tracker, why don't I play with these boards because they do exactly what I'm trying to build. And um, I wasn't quite happy to hear that. I was like, excuse me, as an engineer, creating one's own ideas is far more prestigious than adapting to an external idea. To be honest, I'm kidding. But uh, what I felt is uh, not uncommon. It is known as not invented here syndrome or NIH syndrome. And according to the research paper by David Antons and Frank T. Pillar of RWTH Aachen University, the NIH describes a negative attitude towards knowledge derived from an external idea. So, you know, what's the big deal with rejecting external ideas? I mean, I can completely ignore these and continue to build on my own, does it really matter? Well, according to an older research paper written in 1982 by Ralph Katz and Thomas J. Allen of Sloan School of Management, MIT, the NIH syndrome leads it to reject new ideas from outsiders to the likely detriment of its performance. Hence, in today's video, I want to share a simple framework that I kind of try to do in almost every project I do for the first time. It is how to evaluate similar ideas coming from external sources. To start off with evaluating other project ideas, I believe there are three levels or we can look at it in three stages of difficulty. The first stage is the easiest one, which is to simply create a comparison matrix uh, based on whatever information we have at hand, especially with a quick online search. Number two is a little bit more difficult, which is to go inside individually each of the functional blocks and kind of get to know the engineering details. If we have the information, for example, from a vendor brochure. And number three is the hardest one. And if we have available uh, in our hands a sample or a device that we can work with, then we can actually go ahead and test his performance and see how it works. Well, sometimes it is not always possible, but in this case I have. So I'm going to go through all the three levels and show you how I kind of do it based on the case study of a LoRa GPS tracker. So let's start with the first level. When evaluating similar external ideas, we should at least at the minimum start with a simple comparison matrix. Now the matrix should have components from the subsystem design. You can also have the price or even state the industry. So the subsystem level can be a simple a connection of functional blocks that kind of describes the system. For example, in an IR blaster, an infrared blaster, the microcontroller is powered by the batteries or the USB and is connected to the infrared receiver and emitter. Similarly, for my current LoRa GPS project, I decided to power the microcontroller with a LiPo or a USB and connect the GPS via UART protocol and LoRa radio and e-ink display modules via the SPI protocol. Now that we kind of know the components and uh, on what basis to compare and build the comparison matrix, the next question is is where do we find the information? Well, it depends on the type of device we are building. And there are basically three ways that I would like to divide it. One is the make project. The second is the consumer devices. And the third are the industrial grade devices or equipment. Now for make a project, it is the easiest. We can do a simple search online and we will be able to find a lot of the information based on the open source designs. Now in terms of industrial or consumer devices, sometimes we probably have to even um, email the vendor for a brochure for the list of specifications. So finding information on open source projects is easiest and to get the details, we can get them on websites such as Hackster or Hackaday, Instructables, Tindy, Crowd Supply 
or even say GitHub. So in the end, I gathered about six other projects along with this uh, LilyGo T-Beam to make a comparison for my project. So let's look at the microcontroller. They range from STM32 to SAMD21G to the Wi-Fi enabled ESP266 and ESP32. The batteries, the power source range from 18650 to lithium ion. And finally, the LoRa modules. It ranges from the SX modules by Semtech to RFM modules by Hope RF and Murata. But upon closer look, we will realize that Hope RF's modules are based on, for example, Semtech's SX1276 or SX1231. And even Murata's module has an integrated microcontroller, which is STM32 and Semtech's SX1276. Now, because I looked at external projects, I learned something more about the LoRa industry and the manufacturers. The LoRa technology was developed in France and acquired by Semtech, the founding member of LoRa Alliance. So in summary, a comparison matrix kind of gives us a very a good summary of the various way of implementing the same idea. Which one is the best one? Well, that depends on the application we are trying to build at hand. So sometimes we might just have to stop at the comparison matrix because, you know, if you're looking for high precision, very expensive industrial grade equipment, the information might not be available freely online. But if we have the information from the vendors or online, we should look into the details of the components such as the microcontroller, the power source, sensors, display, and make a comparison with the design we intend to build. So for example, in this case, the T-Beam is using ESP32 microcontroller, whereas my design is using Atmel's SAM D21G. Which one is the better one? Well, it all depends on again on the application at hand and sometimes even uh, the team familiarity also plays a hand. So there is no right or wrong answer in this case. With Arduino CLI that I'm using instead of the Arduino IDE, we can run the command Arduino CLI core list to check which cores are installed. Here both SAMD and ESP32 cores are installed. If the relevant cores are not installed, for example for SAMD21G, we have to add in the the board's URL to install the relevant code. And the same goes for ESP32. We have to get to the installation instructions and then add the board's URL to install the core. And for the power source, I decided to use the rechargeable lithium ion polymer battery with a JST connector. On the other hand, the T-Beam uses a rechargeable 18650 lithium ion battery. Now mechanically using an 18650 with the PCB might be easier because many types of holders are available. Now, you know, this kind of made me think is 18650, which by the way, has a very, very similar technology with the LiPo battery. Maybe I can use that because, you know, mechanical is just so much easier. I can just mount it behind the PCB. Whereas with the LiPo, I probably have to think about uh, the box in this case. But once again, there's no right or right, uh, wrong answer. But because I went ahead Ahead and looked at other similar projects, now I have more options and ideas for my own project. So for the LoRa radio, I have decided to use the Hope RF modules along with the Arduino LoRa library that gives me the ability to send peer-to-peer -peer messages to each of the nodes. And then the T-Beam also uses the Semtech-based modules that can use the same Arduino library. Hence, guess what? In this case, I do not really need to rewrite my firmware for this part of the communication. For the GPS module, I am using P1010 D based on MediaTek's GNSS chipset MT3333. I have used Adafruit's GPS library, which provides a way to read the hardware series incoming data for the raw NEMA strings and then pass it into readable latitude to longitude. The T-Beam, on the other hand, uses another popular line of GPS modules from U-Block's Neo 6 series. According to its schematic, the GPS pins were 
are not the usual UART pins. And from the new 6M module in the schematic, the TXRX pin were traced to be GPIO 34 and 12, which were connected to the ESP32 microcontroller. Hence, I had to use the Arduino's hardware serial library to map these pins 34 and 12 to read the raw NEMA strings and then use another library, TinyGPS, to parse it. And finally, we come to the displays. The OLED SSD1306 display is used in T-Beam and it is a very, very affordable component. I use the Arduino library SSD1306 wire via the I2C protocol. So it is a library written by ThinkPulse for OLED displays on both ESP-266 and ESP-32. With Arduino CLI, I ensured that I installed the library before incorporating it with my firmware. So in comparison, in my project, I chose the WaveShare e-ink module because I wanted the GPS data captured to persist even without any power connection. But this also means that it is far more expensive. And therein lies another crucial engineering question. Does the cost justify the benefits? In my case, the e-ink is far more expensive, but you know, it can provide other pros and cons. So in this case, once again, there is no right or wrong answer. And because I went ahead to explore other external projects, now I can think about, hey, should I change my display or should I keep the same one? So far for the two steps of evaluating external ideas, we try to evaluate them and learn more about other ideas without getting a hand on the actual device. Now, if the cost is affordable or maybe somebody has lent us that device, we might be able to play with the device and gauge its accuracy, precision, latency, or even do a range test. So it looks like we have looked at the main components of uh, the device we are trying to build the main hardware components. Now I have uh, built the firmware for it and uh, try to flash it inside. And uh, to summarize the function of the firmware, I'm going to zoom into the OLED display and say what it is doing. The first three lines are about the current node and the first two rows will be the GPS latitude longitude of the current node with the bigger font size. The third row indicates how long ago the GPS fix was because sometimes, you know, you just lose the connection. And I thought this uh, relative time was important to put on the display. The last row states the Haversine distance with the other LoRa node with which the current node exchanges the latitude longitude information. And finally, the relative time is displayed when the two nodes were able to get a GPS fix within five seconds of one another. Okay, so here comes the fun part, you know, so well, I've learned about the hardware, I flashed in the firmware, so my husband and I finally decided to test it outdoors. We decided to start them in an open space on a bridge overlooking an island, just so that, you know, we give it a best chance to see its performance. So it took about 10 minutes to get a GPS fix under the open skies. And after that, the connection was pretty good because we were pretty much in open space. So as you can see, both nodes were calculating the Haversine distance almost immediately after receiving each other's latitude longitude. The distance between the two nodes calculated was two meters, but sometimes it even dropped to one meter. So now that we have uh, two nodes, we decided to do a range test. So with node A, I decided to stay put on the bridge. And with node B, my husband took a cycle and then he traveled on the cycling path and then we started seeing the distance. So the cycling path was uh, pretty much under the open skies, but uh, there was some tree coverage. In the serial monitor connected to node A on my laptop, I saw the distances increasing for a while. For example, 40 meters increased to about 100 meters. Sometimes there was no peer-to-peer -peer LoRa connection between the two nodes. For example, at around 265 meter, node B was not communicating back its GPS at all. 
call. And then suddenly at 300 uh, meters, uh, the connection was back. So here you can see that my firmware does have some edge case bugs because the distance between the two nodes was obviously not 45 kilometers. Fast forward to an open bend in the cycling path with a clear line of sight uh, with the bridge where I was standing, we did get a range of about one kilometers when both nodes were communicating the GPS information via LoRa to each other. And on the way back on another cycling path, it was pretty cool to watch the serial monitor and the OLED display simultaneously as the Haversign distance was decreasing. I assume the cycle was, you know, under some open space as there was no break in the communication of its latitude longitude back to node A. Once again, putting the devices to actual test was uh, another lesson for me in terms of engineering. The best device does not necessarily mean that it has to have the highest precision sensor, the highest accuracy and the least amount of latency and the longest amount of range. No, that's absolutely not the case because uh, sometimes when we do want these criteria, the cost goes up, but there is no added benefit. On the other hand, the firmware can also be handy uh, so that it uh, kind of eliminates some impossible sensor values. For example, in the case we had, we had 300 meters and then five seconds later, it was 45 kilometers. That is quite impossible. So firmware can also come in handy in how we deal with these edge cases. So I'm sure I have missed out some other important information on what we should look for when evaluating external ideas. So here's a question for all of you. What do you look for and learn in similar external ideas? Recently, I read a book called Guns, Germs and Steel by Jared Diamonds. And uh, if you have read the book Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, it is kind of in the similar vein because it goes through the human history and innovation for the last 20,000 years. This book explores the theme of innovation a lot. And at one point, it talks about some inventors. Edison's famous invention of the incandescent light bulb on the 9th of October October 21st, 1879 improved on many other light bulbs patented by many other inventors between the years 1841 and 1878. Similarly, the Wright brothers' manned powered airplane was preceded by the manned unpowered gliders of Otto Lilienthal and unmanned powered airplanes of Samuel Langley. Similarly, Samuel Morse's telegraph was preceded by those of Joseph Henry, William Cook, and Charles Whitston. So, you know, even though I love reading about biographies about other inventors, scientists, and engineers, I think I've come to realize that there is no such thing as a lone genius. We all build our ideas based on previous ideas or based on similar ideas that are around us. So I hope this uh, gives you some ideas on how to look and evaluate uh, external ideas and why we should not ignore them. In fact, it will help us improve our own ideas. So thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next video.